topics. The content of the following program, including all statements from the host and guests, is to provide general information and commentary about the law. Under no circumstances does any statement made by a host or guest to a caller or listener constitute legal advice or the formation of an attorney-client relationship. And the material from this program should not be viewed as a substitute for personal consultation with an attorney. Welcome to Talk Legal with Jeff Van Treese, who brings you all the latest news in the legal world. Jeff will be discussing a variety of legal topics with experts in the field. If you would like to ask a question or share a story on the air, please call toll-free 888-565-1470. Once again, that's 888-565-1470. Now, let's talk legal with Jeff Van Trees. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Talk Legal. I'm your host, Jeff Van Trees. I'm an attorney with the law firm Oltman, Flynn and Kubler, where we specialize in intellectual property law, including patents, trademarks and copyrights, as well as elder law. You can check us out online and view all episodes of this show on our website at oltmanpatent.com. That's O-L-T-M-A-N-P-A-T-E-N-T.com. I'd also like to acknowledge our other sponsor, Fresh Start Tax. Fresh Start Tax offers a full range of accounting services, including basic tax returns, as well as assistance with tax levies, wage garnishments, and any other tax-related concern. You can find out more by visiting them online at freshstarttax.com. I'd like to thank all of our listeners, including those of you tuning in on the AM dial, as well as those watching online. If you have a question, comment, or story that you would like to share on the air, please feel free to call us toll-free at 888-565-1470. Once again, that number is 888-565-1470. We welcome your calls. I have a very special guest in studio this evening. Her name is Judy Goodman. Judy is a public policy attorney. She specializes in health care policy and is a leading expert on the Affordable Care Act, which we're going to be discussing this evening. Judy is a professor of health care law and health care and health care policy at Florida Atlantic University, where she teaches at both the undergraduate level as well as their MBA program at the business school there at FAU. So, Judy. Thank you so much for joining us this well, evening. Thank you for inviting me. I'm always happy to be able to talk with people and let them learn a little bit more about health care policy and law. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we are in open enrollment now with the Affordable Care Act uh, that will be going through December 15th. And we'd like to talk a little bit about the implications of the Affordable Care Act, known colloquially as Obamacare. And one of the aspects of this act is that it requires people to have minimal essential benefits or they have to pay a penalty. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. The, the first thing people need to understand is if they already have insurance, they don't have to do anything. If they have insurance from their employer or they have insurance through COBRA if they left employment or if they have Medicare or Medicaid, any of those things, even tri TRICARE, they don't need to go to uh, the Affordable Care Act to get insurance. This is an open enrollment for people who are uninsured. The whole purpose of ACA, the Affordable Care Act, was to expand the coverage of people uh, who did not have insurance. So the policies that are being sold, and when you go on the open exchange, you have till December 15th if you want coverage by January 1st, or you can continue to get coverage through February 15th for the rest of the year. That's the window for um, the Affordable Care Act. These policies that they're selling, when you reference the word essential benefits, all those mean I it's a category in the law. There are 10 categories, and those categories are things that are minimally required in the policy and they're, they're large categories in the sense of maternity care. Actually I have a list and I'll, I'll read them. All the policies that are sold must have a minimum level of these ten categories. Ambulance access, um, di different things like that. Um, let me read you the list so that you know exi my, the readers are going to put my glasses on so that I don't miss any of those essential benefit categories because I think it's so important that you understand how, what should be in, um, in an insurance plan. 
ambulatory patient services, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance abuse disorder services are sometimes called behavioral health, prescription drugs, rehabilitative and habilitative services, which is often uh, inferred as autism spectrum uh, services, laboratory services, preventative and wellness and chronic disease management, and the tenth category is pediatric services, including oral and vision care. And you need some degree of it. The Affordable Care Act says you need to have at least 60 percent, which is called the bronze tier, and then you have the silver tier that most people buy because that's the tier of coverage, a 70-30 split that they can get if they qualify subsidies, help. Now this would include people that have Medicare Part A. They would have minimal essential benefits. Yes, right? all anyone who is on a Medicare policy, either a direct traditional Medicare policy that they buy from the government or if they are enrollees in what's called Medicare C, Medicare C is sometimes called Advantage Programs. Those are private insurance companies that offer um, policies, but they're not Medicare direct from the government. They right. are regular private insurance plans. But they're, but they're subsidized by the government, aren't they? Well, they're taking a part of the premium and uh, of, of from your Social Security uh, benefit, yes. So, in fact, that gets to one of the principal ways in which the tax credit is being funded is by reducing the subsidy for Medicare Part C. Well, you know, interestingly enough, these Advantage Program insurance policies were sold to consumers with the thought that they were going to save money for them, the Medicare program. The whole idea of the Affordable Care Act was to try to get control over the escalating Medicare costs, but when they looked at what Medicare C actually did, they were running 14 percent higher than traditional Medicare with a supplemental plan. So that 14 percent um, overage, they need to sort of level the playing field. And so what they're doing is trying to restructure through um, pushing people who would normally get a fee-for-service into what's more of a bundled care, uh, a way to get your care bundled and delivered in a different way. And that would save money. That The intent is to save money so that you can extend the Medicare system longer and try to even it out between the differences between these plans. So I'd like to get into some of the Supreme Court case that came out sure. a few years ago. That was the National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sibelius. And that case was really a landmark decision. Like I said, it was a 5-4 decision, so it was very close. And it ultimately ruled on the constitutional issue of whether the government can force you to have health insurance. It ultimately said that the government can't force you to, help to have insurance, but it can impose a tax if you don't have it. And that is part of the Congress's power to tax under Article I of the Constitution. If you could tell us a little bit about that decision and what the implications are. Yeah, the, in the run-up to that, there were lots of constitutional challenges to the Affordable Care Act. And the one that was heard in March two years ago, 2012, by the Supreme Court, um, that case actually came originally out of Florida. And the, the NFIB, which is a business association group, joined in with 26 other state attorney generals. Most of them were Republicans. Uh, Republican state attorney generals, and they took that case to the Supreme Court and argued, very beautifully argued, that this was constitutionally not proper under the Commerce Clause, that you couldn't force people to do something. In this case, force them to buy insurance. Um, and for, for our listeners, uh, what Judy's referring to about the Commerce Clause is it's part of Article I of the United States Constitution, which limits Congress's ability to regulate interstate commerce, and they can't regulate items that are not part of interstate commerce. So it was that, that was that the was crux. the argument that they were making, and while four of the justices agreed with that argument, it wasn't enough. Uh, it wasn't until the, the fifth justice actually ruled on another uh, argument, which had to do with whether it was constitutional under tax and spend, and under the taxing powers, it was deemed to be okay, as if paying a penalty for not 
having insurance, which is sometimes referred to as the individual mandate, even though it's not really a mandate. We're not requiring people to have insurance. You choose not to have it. And if you choose not to have it, then you have to pay the penalty. That's, uh, and it's, it's relatively small penalty um, in comparison to the cost of insurance because it's roughly 600, can, over time, it will be about $695, which is certainly less than it would be to probably buy an insurance policy. Uh, unless you're totally subsidized 100 percent, which most of the people who are taking the Affordable Care Act are subsidized. In fact, 91 percent of the people who signed up in Florida are subsidized. Wow. Another interesting thing, just as a side note about that case, was that the attorneys for the government, those that were arguing that the Affordable Care Act is constitutional, argued that it was not a tax and in fact the argument that it was a tax is what saved the law. So you have to love that for irony. Yeah, it's, it's, there's been a lot of noise and a lot of partisan jockeying and a lot of good lawyering uh, related to this. Both arguments were beautifully put before the Supreme Court, but you know we live in a system where the majority wins and it was a 5-4 decision and that makes it the law of the land. Now there have been a lot of uh, attempts to repeal it and cause a lot of noise and sable, saber rattling, but basically the there's only one case coming up that really I think will be most interesting to um, the, your listeners, and, and that's a case that's due to come up in, in March. The Supreme Court is going to listen in a case called King versus Burwell. They are going to determine whether subsidies, whether the IRS has the right to um, allow subsidies to stand when the language of the law, four little words that were written into the law that stated that these subsidies could only be available um, to state exchanges when in fact the f most of the exchanges are being run by the federal government. So at issue in this case is can the IRS extend that right federally? Most people would, in, in the law would say, hey, it's a Scrivener's error, it's just a typo, it's not really that important. But for those who philosophically are opposed to the law, they think it's very much important and, the, and the, there's going to be clarification because the court has agreed first week in November to listen to it in March and determine yes or no. Uh, this is either going to um, blow everybody out of the water because if, if, if you get rid of subsidies, if they should rule against the right of the federal government through the IRS to do these subsidies, you could actually technically uh, totally dismantle it because most of the people who are signing up are getting subsidies. So in order for people to get subsidies, it would have to be through the states, and that's not going to happen. It's only going to oh, happen. We can't even expand Medicaid in right. this state, and that's something every hospital would like to see happen. So I don't think it's in the cards, but um, uh, I think that that, I, I also don't think that that will probably be the decision, but you know, you learn in our business never to second guess the Supreme Court. Hard to, you, it's hard to predict uh, based on past performances, and certainly no one predicted what would happen in upholding the law initially. So the pundits were often wrong in that case. Now, do you think, considering that we're in a lame duck session and the Republicans have taken control of Congress, do you think that there might be additional attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act? Well, I, I think that, there, that talk is often cheap and theater and can be sometimes even cheaper. And I, I think that there is a lot of uh, posturing and, and talking to uh, get attention to various partisan points of view. But I, I don't think that this law is going to be repealed. We have 8 million people who have signed up. Very interesting. We're going to take a short break to hear from our sponsors, and then we'll be back with Judy Goodman discussing the Affordable Care Act. Stay tuned. This program is brought to you by Fresh Start Tax. Fresh Start Tax offers a full range of tax and accounting services, including tax return preparation and bookkeeping, as well as back taxes, wage garnishments, unfiled returns, or any other tax-related concern. Our dedicated team of tax attorneys, CPAs, and former IRS agents offer over 60 years of professional tax experience. For a free consultation, call 866-700-1040. That's 866-700-1040. You can also visit us on the web at freshstarttax.com. This program is brought to you by the law firm of Altman, Flynn, and Kubler. 
Our law firm specializes in elder law and intellectual property, including patents, trademarks, and copyrights. If you would like to patent your idea, please contact our Fort Lauderdale office for a free consultation. We offer elder law services, including estate planning, long-term care planning, and preparation of health care documents. We strive to plan for your future needs while allowing you to retain as much dignity and independence as possible. To find out more or to make an appointment, call 954-563-4814. That's 954-563-4814. Or visit us online at oldmanpatent.com. That's O-L-T-M-A-N-D-A-T-E-N-T.com. Spokesperson, not an attorney. You're listening to Talk Legal with Jeff Van Treese, who brings you all the latest news in the legal world. If you would like to ask a question or share a story on the air, please call toll-free 888-565-1470. Once again, that's 888-565-1470. Now, back to Talk Legal with Jeff Van Treese. Back. Thank you for listening. You're listening to, to Talk Legal. Where my guest this evening is public policy lawyer Judy Goodman. We've been discussing the Affordable Care Act, and since you are a public uh, policy attorney, I'd like to for you just to explain to our listeners what is public policy law. Well, the way I define it, I focus on issues of concern to the public, whether they are uh, corporate issues that have public impact for companies or governmental issues for agencies that may deal with things that have an, an adverse or a positive impact on the public. Often I'll be helping hospitals figure out whether a policy is appropriate for them um, or a governmental agency in determining how best to uh, plan their health uh, outreach and community needs assessments as to what needs to be offered for um, optimal health for the public. I, I, I guess I would clarify that my role is to help the public be healthier in whatever way that delivery system is, is going to best come about. And I've always understood policy as being the animating purpose behind laws. It's why the laws exist and why laws are not just technicalities written on a piece of paper. And with the, Ob with the Obamacare or Affordable Care Act, the policy debate is very wide-ranging. And I'd like to get into that a little bit. Uh, you know, when what we heard in the news a few, I think it was about a month ago, was one of the consult major consultants for the Affordable Care Act and its structuring was quoted as saying that it's simply a tax, the Affordable Care Act is simply a tax on healthy people. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that quote and whether th whether that was accurate and whether the criticism of the Obamacare has been totally forthcoming and, and, and meaningful? Well, I would disagree with that definition. Um, I, I think that just looking at the sheer numbers of who has signed up, of the, um, in Florida we had approximately a million people that have signed up uh, for the Affordable Care Act, and when you look at the demographics of that, um, 70, 73 percent of the people needed subsidies. Um, most were women, and most were older women, over 45. So that w doesn't really align particularly with just being healthy. If you're older, you tend to be not as healthy. It suggests to me that people who are choosing the Affordable Care Act may be choosing it because they were shut out financially from regular insurance or discriminated against in the costing and pricing of ex policies beforehand. So my guess is that Many of the people who are signing up is because that was the only choice available to them, and they tend not to be the healthy ones. Now, in risk, when you try to allocate risk in insurance, obviously you need to spread the risk, and the healthier young people that you can sign up, uh, it, that is part of the reason that it's mandated and that there is a penalty to try to incent young people to come in to make that risk um, you know, putting healthy people into the pool is very important. Um, so that there has to be a lot of um, incentive uh, because a lot of times young people will feel invincible and feel that they're not um, subject to be worried about insurance. And, and so the, the design of these programs is intended to appeal to young people to bring them in. And of course in assessing the Affordable Care Act you have to consider it against the backdrop of our current health care system. 
and we have something called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, or EMTALA for short, which essentially provides that a hospital emergency room cannot turn somebody away for inability to pay or lack of insurance. And so even though people might not be, have health insurance, it doesn't mean that you can exclude them from getting health care altogether. That's pretty expensive care. EMTALA is a federal, it's a federal law, and the law reads that people do have to, when they come and present at a hospital, they, they do have to be screened and they have to be um, helped in, to the degree that they're stable before they're transferred to somewhere else, but it doesn't require a diagnosis and it doesn't require any kind of aftercare. It's really a screening and stabilizing uh, kind of impact, but it's at a very expensive cost. The typical person who would enter into a emergency room um, admission is likely going to cost several thousands of dollars compared to uh, perhaps a, a, a $100 visit to a, a more appropriate level of care if they were getting preventative care. Well, that's why a lot of proponents of Obamacare have said that it's a way to make people be responsible for their own health care. They have to have insurance, so they can't simply use an emergency room and then not pay. There is a lot of incentive built into the Affordable Care Act to try to create a culture of healthy people, preventative consciousness, and lots of ways to incent primary care um, in, in a way that will try to bring care at a more appropriate level, whether it be preventative or primary versus specialist and expensive. Right. I'd like to talk a little bit about Medicaid expansion. Florida has mm -hmm. not expanded Medicaid. And, of course, we've always heard it. We've been hearing about the coverage gap between people that do not qualify for Medicaid and people that also don't qualify for the tax credit under the Affordable Care Act and how it's really impossible for them to get insurance. We were talking earlier that there, I there are still some ways with which they can get coverage of some sort. It's a very frustrating problem. Florida is one of the states that's chosen not to expand. It's a finan for the most part a financial as well as a philosophical reason. Um, already before expansion, $21 billion of our state budget is Medicaid, and that's only primarily to women and children. So able-bodied men are not on getting Medicaid without expansion. Um, this. Uh, you have to understand it's a balancing and policy is a balancing and competing interest kind of thing. If you have $21 billion of your budget, that's going to probably push out everything from schools, education, other things the state is responsible for. So some of that pushback has to do with fiscal responsibility and concern over the budget. Um, but on the other hand, you have hospitals that understand and need and went in, were induced to be helpful in the Affordable Care Act by, with the expectation that they were going to get coverage with expanding Medicaid. So it's very frustrating to, for them to have given concessions in uh, pricing and all sorts of uh, things to make this happen and then not get that end of the deal. Uh, Medicaid has not expanded and does not look likely in this legislative session that it will either in coming March 2015. It looks like there's just continuing to be a philosophical and financial objection. And of course undocumented workers don't qualify for Medicaid, which is one of the major misconceptions. Y yeah, y you don't qualify, but there are free clinics in our community where people can get care, and, um, and just like uh, hospitals that you just mentioned. Nobody turns down people in, in a time of need. People, regardless of their country of origin, if they have a disease, that's a public health issue and they must be treated, certainly you know, stabilized as I just described, and, and um, treated in, in, a, in that fashion. So getting back to the policy debate, whether you're for or against Obamacare, I think that in assessing any piece of legislation, it's always important to consider it against the backdrop of whatever existed before the legislation was adopted. And, you know, before Obamacare, there really was no free market health care system. Anyone that's worked in health care knows that it's a variety of interests and in what I would call cartels that set prices, whether it's insurances and so forth. And 
it really never was a free market system. So when I, you know when we hear that it's a socialist system with Obamacare, it never really was free market before. That's my own feeling. I'm wondering what you think. Well, first of all, the Affordable Care Act has to do with the um, reform of the private insurance business. So th all of the insurers that are involved are private insurers. So th this concept of using buzzwords like socialism is just ridiculous. Um, it has nothing to do with socialism whatsoever. This is the, this is the reform of the private insurance coverage system and the uh, ability to try to get the pricing um, restrained so that Medicare can last longer and it be extended by at least 12 years. So um, that is the goal, covering more people and trying to get some of the discriminatory practices out of the private insurance um, uh, system. Uh, that doesn't mean that that has been accomplished yet. We're, we're obviously learning about narrow networks and bumps in the road that are continuing to be discovered as we move along, but it's, it's moving in the right direction. More people are covered and costs are coming down. Well, we are running out of time. I'd like to give a very special thanks to my guest, Judy Goodman, a public policy attorney. I'm sure that we'll be uh, hearing more from you as this issue uh, becomes more and more in the public sphere, and we'll wait and see what happens with these new, ca these new cases that are coming down the pike. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, please tune in next week, Tuesday from 6 to 6.30, where my guest will be George Frank, and we'll be discussing wills and probate. Thank you so much. This has been Talk Legal. I'm Jeff Van Trees, and have a great evening. Thank you for listening to Talk Legal with Jeff Van Trees. Tune in next week for more insightful and exciting information about the law. You can contact Jeff by email at jvt, the number two, law at gmail.com. Or give him a call at 561-789-6866. That's 561-789-6866. The content of the preceding program, including all statements from the host and guests, is to provide general information and commentary about the law. Under no circumstances does any statement made by a host or guest to a caller or listener constitute legal advice or the formation of an attorney-client relationship, and the material of this program should not be viewed as a substitute for personal consultation with an attorney. The opinions expressed on